Welcome to Things Concerning Himself. I'm Pastor John Anderson. Thanks for joining us today as we consider to look at the Old Testament to find pictures, cameos, silhouettes of our Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe some of you might remember a course that uh, went like this. In the morning, I see his face. In the evening, his form I trace. In the darkness, his voice I know. I see Jesus everywhere I go. Beautiful course. I would like to modify that slightly by adding four other words to the end of that. So that it would read, in the morning I see his face, in the evening his form I trace, and in darkness his voice I know. I see Jesus everywhere I go in the Old Testament. I see Jesus everywhere I go in the Old Testament. Remember that Jesus said, they are they, the Old Testament scriptures, that testify of me. And on that journey to Emmaus, when he spoke of the things concerning himself, he brought to view all these uh, interesting, fascinating, instructive things, lessons from the Old Testament. And it's uh, hard to imagine that somewhere along that conversation, the subject of the sanctuary did not come up, where the Animals of sacrifice shed their blood as prophecies pointing toward Calvary. So today we're going to take a look at another one of the um, articles that was in the courtyard, the labor and its significance, and I invite you to pray with me as we begin. Father in heaven, again we want to thank you for your mighty and powerful love that allowed that sent Jesus to this earth to die for our sins, to shed his blood and to have the legal authority to save us and not only just wipe away our sins, but actually to change us, to convert us so that we can reflect the beauty of your character. This requires a great miracle, I know, Lord, but you are powerful enough. Nothing is too hard for the Lord if we will but surrender ourselves to you. So, Lord, my prayer today is that as we study this labor, that we will see the opportunity for you to cleanse and purify us if we would just submit ourselves and our wills to you. I pray that every single one of us will do that today. In Jesus' name, amen. I remind you that we're talking about the sanctuary in the Old Testament, and uh, there was a courtyard that was defined by a perimeter of 50 cubits by 100 cubits. On the east side, the east side only, there was a door, a gate, an entrance, and of course, Jesus is the door. Jesus is the way. It was on the east so that people coming westward would be turning their back, on the rising sun, representing that and all forms of false worship. The very first thing that you came to in the courtyard was the altar of burnt offering, that mighty symbol of the cross of Calvary, where Jesus died to save us from sin. It was on that altar that the innocent victims uh, were consumed as the burnt offering, and uh, no one outside the congregation could see that last part of the sacrifice, only the priest because of the way the altar was put together. And that altar was covered, even though it was made out of wood, it was covered by bronze plates beaten out that had belonged to the censors of the, rebel, the rebels, Kor, Dathan, and, I, and Abiram. And they were recovered and beaten out, hammered out, and they formed the plates that covered the wooden uh, altar so that it could uh, perform its function of consuming sacrifices by fire, by the holy fire ignited by God himself. That was the article that you first encountered telling us that we come to the Lord as we are and he accepts us, he justifies us, he credits us with Christ's righteousness. But that's not the end of the story. God is much too loving and merciful to leave us trapped in the grip hold, the vices of sin. He wants to redeem us. He came to set us at liberty and break the bonds, the fetters that bind us in bad habits and bad thought patterns. And so we come to the labor. That's the next item. But always keep in mind which is first and which is second. The labor is not first. We don't get cleaned up before we get come to God. We come to God just as we are. And then he works on us to clean us up and uh, purify us from moral depravity. So the location is, is very, very important. So we're looking at the labor today. And it came between the altar and the tabernacle itself. We're reading from the Bible, Exodus chapter 40 and verse 30. That's uh, the part of the Bible that describes how after everything was constructed, constructed how it was laid out, how, how things were actually positioned. 
And so we read there in Exodus chapter 40 and verse 30, he set the laver between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar and put water there for washing. So it's very clear that it was the altar first as you entered, then the laver, then the tabernacle. And that physical arrangement, again, is very theologically important to recognize. If somebody had asked me how to do it, I probably would have said the other way. Uh, but it, it'll never work that way. If we wait to get cleaned up before we come to God, it's never going to happen. We have to recognize that he wants to accept us just as we are. And then he justifies us and works on solving the problems of our life. Once we're inside the courtyard, once we've gone through the door and we're now in the courtyard, we're surrounded by that beautiful white linen, nine-foot-tall perimeter, representing the righteousness of Christ, telling us that as long as we're in Christ, as long as we don't resist his gentle impulses to lead us closer to him, to uh, cleanse us from all sin, that we are standing with God is secure and we can have peace. What a beautiful thought that is. Now, while we're thinking about the arrangement of these items, I'm going to share a thought with you that I hope makes sense to you. It's a blessing to me. We said that we come through the doorway from the east. From the, as sinners, we're going from the east to the west. We go through the doorway, the veil, the door, that represents Jesus. Everything there represents Jesus. We go through the doorway. We come to the altar of sacrifice, represents the cross, Calvary. Then we come to the laver, that represents cleansing from sin. Then we uh, come to the holy place in which we uh, grow in our Christian walk. And there we have the table of showbread. We'll study all these things in more detail later. But we have the table of showbread on our right side. We have the seven-branched uh, lampstand on our left. And we have the altar of incense in front of us. And these are the three things that show us how we can improve in our Christian living and grow as Christians. And then beyond the other veil is the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant is and the very presence of God. This expresses God's ideal for us in our Christian journey. We go through the veil. We receive Christ. We accept his sacrifice. He begins the work of cleaning us up. We feed on his word. We walk in his light. Our prayers are, are mingled with the merits of Jesus as the incense rises. And eventually, eventually it's God's purpose that we live in his very presence. It's typified by the most holy place. So this is a beautiful picture of what God wants to do with us. At every stage, he uh, accepts us as his children. But he does have the intention to lead us step by step closer and closer and closer to him. And I hope that you have that desire in your heart as well. The thought that, uh, that we see today, though, is that while we are traveling from east to west, Jesus, our divine redeemer, went the opposite direction. Have you ever thought about that? Jesus had glory at the throne of God. It was his by right. He was the sovereign ruler of the universe. But in order to accomplish salvation, he had to leave that glory. He came down to this earth. And along with that, he was cleansed or baptized, not for his own sins, but he was baptized in the River Jordan by, by John uh, as a symbol of what we should do. And then ultimately, it led to the altar, the cross. We go this direction, Jesus went this direction. But it was all to accomplish God's great purpose of saving mankind and restoring us to fellowship and uh, living in his presence. The order of sequence is very significant there. As we think about the labor, we're going to start by thinking about the word itself, just as we did with the word altar, which meant height or raised. Uh, the word labor comes from the root uh, to wash. And if you know any Spanish, you have any of that background, uh, you know that you can see a connection there with the word lavar and the word labor. Maybe you have seen the phrase um, lave sus manos. We're in an age when uh, cleanliness and washing our hands and using disinfectant is very, very important to uh, inhibit the transmission of disease and viruses. So the labor means to wash or cleanse. It's, uh, the Hebrew word that we're looking at is kior, and it's uh, used 23 times in the Old Testament. 20 of those times, uh, almost 90% then, uh, is translated labor. So it predominantly refers to that article of furniture that was in the courtyard. Uh, the derivation of that word in Hebrew, it comes... Uh, from a background that means something round like a dish or a pot or a cauldron for cooking, a wash bowl or a wash basin. 
So that's a little bit about the word. It has to do with washing or cleansing. The lesson of the labor is that we have sinned and we need to be cleansed. Now, when we think about the cleansing that we're uh, considering here, is that an outward cleansing only or is, does it go beyond that? Well, um, in the time of Jesus, the cleansing that the people focused on mostly was outward cleansing. And you remember how that uh, the um, scribes and Pharisees became very upset with Jesus and his disciples because they did not engage in this particular form of ritualistic washing uh, before they ate. They had a prescribed manner by which was very uh, um, detailed and uh, they had to wash their hands in a certain way before they felt themselves cleansed to eat. And while Jesus was not against personal hygiene, not in the least, nevertheless, he realized that the focus should be more on the inward cleansing rather than the outward cleansing. Now, again, I repeat, we need to pay attention to outward cleansing today because we live in an era where, where viruses are being uh, shared and transmitted and we need to be clean. And the Lord gave rules in the Old Testament for the purpose of, of hygiene and taking, taking care of needs in the proper way. In the book of Leviticus, we read a lot about that. We read about clean foods. We read about being clean, cleansed from leprosy. But overall, the cleansing that the Bible is talking about is not that outward cleansing, but the inward cleansing. You remember the story when Samuel went to find a replacement for King Saul? And he was told it was going to be a son of Jesse, so he went to Jesse's house. And one by one, the sons of Jesse passed before him. At first, he thought the uh, eldest was certainly the Lord's anointed, but no, I have rejected him, and so on. Finally, they came down to the last one. But along the way, uh, the Lord told Samuel this, which is a very, very uh, concentrated pearl of wisdom that applies in many, many contexts of the Bible. The Lord said, man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So the cleansing that the Bible is really focusing on is the inward cleansing of moral defilement. That's what God really wants to uh, have, have happen in our lives. And that's what the labor represented. Now, it's true that the priests washed their physically, their hands and their feet, and there was a ceremonial or a ritualistic type of cleansing that went along with that. But it was all to portray or convey the idea of what God wants to do inside of us, to clean us up inside so that we have pure thoughts and we can have... Um, pure actions as a result. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15, I'm going to read a few verses, verse 11, 19, and 20 from Matthew 15. This is in response to the complaint about the Pharisees that the disciples weren't washing right. Jesus said, not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. So again, the focus that the Lord is looking at is that inward cleansing to clean our minds as well as our actions. I'm going to read some verses here from the Old Testament that describe this type of cleansing, starting with uh, Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4. The question is asked, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Now, when we think about that, we can compare it to the lessons of the sanctuary. The holy place came after the labor. First the altar, then the labor, then you entered the holy place. And then finally, the presence of God. So the question is asked, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, who may stand in his holy place? And the answer is given. He who has clean hands and a pure heart. One who has stopped at the altar to be justified and has stopped at the labor also for the cleansing to take place. This same David later said in Psalm 51, after his tragic sin with the incident with Bathsheba, he said, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. He was talking about the inward cleansing that he recognized was very needful. Through Isaiah, the Lord said, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, put away evil from your doings, from before my eyes, cease to do evil and learn to do good. God's program is a complete one. He takes the giant eraser and erases our sins and casts them into the depths of the sea, but he doesn't stop there. 
he goes on to work changes in our life so that we can reflect his glory and his character. First the altar, justification, then the labor when the cleaning process begins. The cleansing is very important. In the fourth chapter of Isaiah, beginning with verse 2, some very significant words are written. It says, in that day, and it's talking about the very, very last days, no doubt including the day when Jesus Christ comes back. At the very end, this is what it's going to be like. Listen carefully, he says, Isaiah 4, verse 2. In that day, the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious. Who is the branch of the Lord? That's Jesus Christ. Throughout the Old Testament, he is the branch, the uh, rod and the stem of Jesse and so on. In that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious. Now, that's in that day at the end of time. When Jesus Christ came the first time, he did not come beautiful and glorious. Glorious in character, but not glorious in outward appearance. But on that day when he comes back, indeed, he will be beautiful and glorious. Later in Isaiah chapter 33, it says, we will see the king in his beauty. So that's the time period we're talking about. In that day, the branch, Jesus, of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious. And the fruit of the earth, who's that? That's God's people. The ones who have been growing into maturity in their characters. The fruit of the earth will be excellent and appealing for those of Israel who have escaped. And it shall come to pass that he who is left in Zion and he who remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. So we have three words there, those that have escaped, those that are left, and those that remain. And it's all describing the group of the remnant, which is the last portion of God's people. You read about it in Revelation chapter 12, and verse 17 describes who the remnant, the last day people of God are, those who have the, have the testimony of Jesus and keep the commandments of God. The passage continues. These will be called holy. Everyone who is recorded, what's that talking about? Their names are written in the book of life. How important is that? Absolutely. Everyone who is recorded among the living in Jerusalem when, now it's expressing this as something that's already taken place then. This process has already been finished. When the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion, the church, and has purged the blood of Jerusalem from her midst by the Spirit, capitalize the word Spirit is the Holy Spirit, by the spirit of judgment, he's the one that brings conviction into our mind and leads us to repentance, by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. Sometimes burning accomplishes purification, as we'll read in some texts coming up here. What a beautiful text that is. Every, every phrase of it has a deep meaning. The ones who are the remnant will have experienced this, this washing away of the filth and this purging of our sins uh, that is accomplished by God's power and not ours. We start at the altar, but then we have to proceed to the labor and become washed. One aspect of that washing we can see in the symbolism of baptism. Uh, when Paul was uh, waiting a little bit, Ananias says, why, why do you tarry? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. So baptism uh, is a ceremony that expresses the purpose of this washing to cleanse us from sin. If you've not been baptized, but the way that the Bible teaches, by immersion, as our Lord gave us an example, please do not delay. It's very, very important. God, it gives God the right to put another layer of protection and guidance into your life. Be baptized. That's the gospel command. And the labor uh, expresses that symbolism, the washing that took place there. We're going to continue to read some more Bible verses here. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 14. O Jerusalem, wash your heart from wickedness that you may be saved. How long shall your evil thoughts lodge within you? I can't describe how God can cleanse our thinking, but the Bible says that he can bring every thought into captivity of Christ if we will allow him to do so. We can be given a new mind and our thinking can be changed, and that will result in proper behavior. I'm going to read now from Malachi chapter 3, another beautiful passage. It says, Who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? He is like a refiner's fire. Fire used as a symbol of purif purification. He is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller soap. So here are brought to view two different cleansing agents uh, in symbolic form, fire and water. Now, the one in the courtyard of the sanctuary that's highlighted is the water, the labor. But the fire was certainly present in many other uh, contexts in the, in the sanctuary service. But cleansed by fire, cleansed by water. 
That's what God wants to do. He is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi, members of the church, and will purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord as in the days of old, as in the former years. And we can't, can't not quote also Zechariah chapter 13, verse 1, speaking of Jesus. In that day, a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for, uncle- and for uncleanness. Yes, we need the altar. We need to accept Christ as our Savior. But then we need to also progress on to the labor and be washed from our sins and allow him to change our way of thinking and our behavior. Satan says, you don't need to do that. Why? Uh, you're just as good as the next guy. When I was growing up, there was a book that became popular and it had the phrase, I'm okay, you're okay. Well, and maybe in some circumstances that might be construed as being some truth in that. But in the Bible picture, we are unclean. We are lost. We are desperate, in desperate need. And only Jesus can cleanse us from sin. But he's willing to do that. He's willing to accomplish all this uh, purging away of the filthiness of sin, if we will allow him to do it. If we give him access to our hearts, he will go in, like you do on a computer where you have give somebody permission to use a remote access and they can fix viral problems in your computer. In the same way, if we give permission, the Holy Spirit will come into our hearts and cleanse us and change us so that we reflect the image of Jesus, which is his, his goal. The Bible tells us that we can know right from wrong and we can... We, have, we will be responsible to our maker on the day of judgment. But it also gives us this beautiful promise. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. Notice the two parts to God's program being highlighted here. He is faithful and just to do what? To forgive us our sins. That was made possible because of what happened on the altar. To forgive us our sins, but it doesn't stop there. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's the labor. So in that one verse, you can go back to uh, the Old Testament sanctuary service and see how beautifully it was typified and taught. He can forgive us, that's the altar, and he wants to cleanse us. But both parts are necessary, and uh, uh, neither one of them can be excluded. Uh, Paul expressed this dual application, this dual aspect again in Ephesians chapter 5. He's using the family as a model of Christ's love for the church. He says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. When did did Christ give himself for the church? It was on the cross. Okay, that's first. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it. There again, altar and labor. The sacrifice, the forgiveness, and then the cleansing. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. And that might he presented, presented to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it would be that it should be holy and without blemish. That's God's ideal. That's not God's intent. Every step in the process is important. And the sequence in those verses is correct. Forgive and then cleanse. Alter and then labor. That was Paul's experience. He saw the light. He met Jesus. And then after that, he was baptized. Now, let's think for a minute about the physical construction of the labor. There are some beautiful lessons uh, having to do with that. We're told that the, the uh, we're, not, we're not told about the dimensions of the labor in the wilderness, but we're told that Solomon's labor was a huge thing. It rested on the backs of uh, 12 bronze oxen, and its capacity was somewhere between 10,000 and 15,000 gallons of water, very large. But going back to the uh, labor of the Old Testament, remember that the altar, we said, was uh, constructed of a, a, a wood framework, framework covered with the hammered out bronze plates of the rebels. The labor also was constructed of uh, implements that have significance, have, have a lesson attached to them. And what, what were they? We read in Exodus chapter 38, verse 8, he made the labor of bronze and its base of bronze from the bronze mirrors of the serving women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle. Now that's interesting. There you have the basin of water. Its base is constructed out of the mirrors. Now, uh, the mirrors that it's talking about were not the ones made out of glass that we have today. They didn't have that back in their day, but they could polish 
um, metal, bronze, and other things to the point where they could give a pretty accurate reflection. And those were the mirrors that it's talking about. So the bronze mirrors of the ladies were made to form the base. What's the lesson there? Well, I would like to suggest briefly three lessons. First, mirror, a mirror can be thought of as a tool of vanity. It is in a mirror when we look at ourselves and we try to beautify ourselves on the outside. And we can see that in a spiritual way as uh, uh, following the paths of the world. So that the, the, the uh, labor was made out of the bronze mirrors of the women who were willing to give that up. They were willing to let go of, of the service of vanity and the focus on our outside appearance and let that become an instrument, a tool for the Lord. So that's one lesson that we can see. The, the base of it was made from the bronze of the mirrors. Those who were willing to surrender self and allow those instruments that could have been used for vanity to be used in the Lord's service. There's another lesson and that a mirror is something that reflects. And the term mirror is used in the Bible, in the book of James, to refer to that which reflects the character of God, that is, his holy law, the Ten Commandments. I'm reading from James uh, and chapter 1 and verse 23. <clears throat> James 1, verse 23. It says, If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who observes his natural face in a mirror, he observes himself and goes his way and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, speaking of the Ten Commandments, and continues in it is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of, of the work. And the, this one will be blessed in what he does. And he makes it clear in the next chapter that this perfect law of liberty is the Ten Commandments. So think of this beautiful symbolism then, the foot of the labor made out of the mirrors. The mirrors represent God's law, that which that which that we look at in order to uh, realize that we are in a condition that needing cleansing, and then the base and the water that provides the cleansing for us. A very harmonious, symmetrical picture of what God wants to do. Point out, point out our sins by means of his holy law, and then provide cleansing so that we can be purified. A third way of looking at it is that a mirror is that which reflects, and what God wants to do in us is create his image, his likeness, so that we reflect the beauty of his character. And in Revelation chapter 15, verse 2, it says that ultimately those that gain the victory will stand on the sea of glass, a perfect reflection of God's love exhibited in their character. I invite you to go through the veil, receive Christ, go to the altar, accept his provision, and then go to the labor and let him cleanse you of your evil thoughts and evil deeds so that you can be a perfect reflection of the life and character of Jesus. So he can point to you and say, here are those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. I pray that this will be your experience and mine today as we live out these last few hours of earth's history waiting for our Lord to come in the sky.